All right, what's going on, guys? It's your boy, Nistro here, and we are back. Um, and today, I am showcasing my Gate Guardian build. Um, at least a, a, this this build is more of like in beta. It's it's in flux, but I wanted to show you guys some replays. And before the replays went off, I sort of wanted to explain the theory behind my build. So first off, um, one point of one point of contention a lot of Gate Guardian players have is how many copies of each name do you have? And my theory was that you only play one of each because all your cards that dig them out, both your tank, your wall shadow, and the Gate Guardian spells and traps, all of them get them from either the deck or or the banish zone. So that means for gate for your gate monsters to be the most effective, there's either one of two places that you want them. You want them either on the on the field or in the graveyard. We have cards like Cast Your Birth to like to, to let us normal summon them because we don't want to brick on these guys. We don't want to we don't want to have these in our hand, right? But if we do have them in our hand, we have the Sacred Swords. We have a bunch of different ways to use them when they are in hand, but we don't want to rely on opening them. Um, I was also playing a Pankatron. This this isn't going to be like the exact build from the replays because I've been switching the build up so much that I don't even remember what the exact build looked like, but I know Pankatrops was somewhere in there. And I know it looked something like this. I know the ratios with the hero live seems weird. And that's because paying half your life points really just doesn't mean shit unless you're going second. So I don't like to keep these in. These guys, I don't like to play more than one of this because when am I gonna have a gate guardian on the field, right? Like the fact that like this card is like doing too much before it actually happens. And Magician Souls probably does fix some of the problems in this deck, but when I was testing with Magician Souls, that bitch never resolved. Like, I never actually had Souls um, resolve draw two. And when it did, I did fairly well, you know, because you get to add two from deck or banish stone to hand. And because of that, you get to make combined a lot faster. And, you know, because you're milling Kazajin, there's a possibility where if you have Wind and Thunder, or you have Guardian, or you have Jirai Gumo, which I don't play in this build, if you have those cards plus Magician Souls, it might be an instant Gate Guardian combined compared to um, other builds where, and, and it's also you know drawing you two more cards, so you're digging into your deck and you're also getting more searches. While when not playing Souls, you may be less vulnerable to losing to a single hand trap, but at the same time, I was trying to build a deck that's less vulnerable or less reliant on souls resolving because if you don't draw souls then your hand is stuck with a lot of cards like double attack where you need a gate guardian for this thing to resolve, right? Tactics, because I feel like if we get hand trapped, we need to catch up. So I usually take the draw two or the look at my opponent's hand and put one back if I already have a gate monster on the field or if I already have a way into a gate monster. Keeper of Dragon Magic, he's one of my favorite starters in this deck because you can discard one of the names and then you can search fusion deployment and then he can summon back the name from the graveyard as well. Both of his effects lock you into fusion. So the fact that he searches fusion deployment, it's really good. And if we were playing the branded build, a Keeper of Dragon Magic even has like double the utility now because then it could search branded fusion on top of fusion deployment. You don't have to crutch too much on Alubur or you don't even have to play like Springin's Kit or anything. You could play Springin's Kit because the way the branded stuff works is that you're going to be milling Fallen of Albaz a lot. So you, you definitely could play Springin's Kit, but Keeper of Dragon Magic is like a staple. It's even good late game because if these, if you just have one or two of these in your graveyard, like if one of your fusions gets broken down completely, he can just bring it back. If you mix that with a tank or a field spell, that means you can make another fusion. For my fusion ratios, I like two combined, two wind and water, and then one of each of the other others because there is no situation I don't need to play more than one of him either he searches me a game ending card like Ryoku Guardian or he just has no utility at all if I'm going first I have a route where I can make him and I can make wind and water and so I just make the both of them so that I have more recovery turn three if you play under four summons 
right? Like you don't have to worry about Nib, but if you're gonna play over five summons, at least play two fusions during your turn so that if they nib you, you get two of your names back from the banished zone and you get to bring and you get to make another fusion after that. So the nib doesn't really hurt you that bad. We're only playing a rise heart because, you know, the cash tira matchup, but really it's Diablosis and big guy that are that are the sauce here. Diablosis, you can make it going first if you draw a unicorn and like say like a tank tank can put a name down overlay with unicorn detach unicorn look at their extra deck banish one so you get matchup knowledge so that means if you if you also open a way into field spell that is like a wind and water plus one of their monsters already banished and then you can use birth to revive the unicorn and unicorn can um it, once they activate a monster effect during their turn you can banish another card from their extra deck and Diablosis will start banishing more cards from the top of their deck. And then because you have birth, if your opponent activates a spell card, you can banish three cards in their graveyard. And so that will also trigger Diablosis as well if you have both. So pretty cool. And that's why Sacred Swords of Seven Stars, I like it in this deck so much. It just has a lot of utility. I just hate playing it because I never get good draws off of it, which does sort of sound like bad deck design and copium and stuff. But I just think the these guys like having them in hand only for them to get banished to for you to draw two into cards that don't really do much for you anyway i think is isn't really the best approach but i i do understand why this card is played because it just allows for so much recovery as well it it does unbrick some hands where you do end up drawing these and it does make wanting to draw these or wanting to draw or search these with like wind and thunder and ryoku guardian more more viable because now you get to trade those in for potentially more resources more fuel to make more fusions and potentially even follow up if you're going first you know side and solemn judgments the changing baron ancient fairy stuff um so before i was playing Itelli to it's more of a budget build tech honestly and so i i might end up taking it out of oh, the cash terror build because it's way less likely that, that you'll see this but i i was playing armageddon knight into into destrudo so that you can make ancient fairy ancient fairy pop field spell search pseudo space pseudo space banish field spell it becomes so that you get to place basically a fusion down with less resources this deck no, does need more recursion that's why i'm playing barrier arcade board blocker because this is the only card I could think of that would actually recycle your field spell but it's kind of slow because it only recycles it during end phase so like although it is a great utility card it just does not do enough Boral sword again this was more for my budget build I like for my cash terror build I might have to take this out and I'll talk more about the budget build later on playing more cash terrors is the preferred way to play this deck even Pankotrops is like great going second. It, it is more of more of like a side card than it is a main card, but I, I just I did end up taking it out in so we're gonna go over this replay, me going against a tier limit player. And so I start off with a hero lives, and again paying the 4k, especially going first, is just not worth it. Honestly, I could have normal summoned this Prisma. Right, like if I would have like drawing this Prisma would have been preferred because now it's like I had to choose between a hero lives or cash or unicorn and I would have much preferred unicorn, but I had no second um, second way to get a name out. So I preferred in this situation just to do Prisma because I wanted to get that second name out. So I paid half my life points and I went for Prisma reveal combined. I always reveal combined for any, you know, fusion deployment or whatever. Um, go into Kazijin, and basically my whole theory is that Kazijin will always be the most important name. That's the only one I play two of in a normal build. I think Suijin and Sangha, you can recycle them if you know what you're doing. And Kazijin has to be a two because it makes the two most important fusions. That's Thunder and Wind and your Wind and Water. Now, I don't really know why I went for Thunder and Wind here. I definitely should have just gone into Wind and Water and then pass turn. But I don't know. I was I was cooking something. So. So we go into wall shadow here and I realized how stupid this was because I wall shadowed for the cause that I banished. Um, and so be like literally because of this, he removes this wall shadow from field. I have no follow up like. <laughs> I don't know why the fuck I put this Kazujin instead of one from deck or like the Suijin from deck, but I, I like, I don't know. 
I must have been smoking that shit. So anyway, seeing my opponent was on tier limits was like, I didn't know how to feel because everyone's playing tier limits differently at this point. And so um, he ended up milling with Scream and Merly and stuff. And he goes into Dragostopelia, which um, the one thing about tier is that although... Although it does have its faults nowadays, I do still think that it's a solid deck because it has its ideas in order. I just think more players need to understand their ratios better for like stuff like milling and and um, milling probability and and all that stuff. And I didn't think this was game, but then I forgot I paid half my life points. So literally, I lost this game, and I was just like, "Oh shit." Maybe I shouldn't play Triple Hero Lives. Okay, so now um, we're in we're in game two. He ashes the unicorn, so that's why I have talents here. You know, I wanted to again make up for the fact he just ashed my unicorn. I probably should have summoned Tank first just to put a name down, and then talents to draw two. That would have been the smarter play, but I just like raw activated talents here because I I, I didn't want to wait. Um. And I drew Fenrir plus Sacred Swords, which is honestly not the worst hand. Um, I, and here again, I Sacred Swords immediately when I could have heavy tanked uh, Normal Summon Tank and then um, put a name down first before going into Sacred Swords so that I don't have to uh, potentially draw another name. So Banish, draw two. And the, these are some pretty good draws, right? Because now, now I have Wall Shadow, and I can um, now I can make Wind and Water, and I also have access to Diablosis. So we put Kazijin in the zone. We put Suijin in the zone. Make Wind and Water. I don't make Diablosis because I wanted to keep Unicorn on board. That, that's what it was because I didn't search Birth. And so, because I didn't search birth, I'm like, okay, do I would I rather have Diablosis or would I rather keep Unicorn plus Tank? And uh, I guess that was the answer to my question <laughs> um, in that moment. So, game three, he goes first. Uh, he put in the D barrier, starts with the uh, planet, mills a, a statue, and... We didn't get any good mills off this statue. I mean, we got Shadow Ghoul, but they milled two field spell, which is just insane. Um, so we we can start with Fenrir here, which it's really good that we we drew Fenrir because um, this this D barrier would have killed us if we didn't. So we get Kazijin. Wait, hold on. How am I placing... Wait, did he bounce my tank? Tank should be on field, shouldn't it? Is this some kind of glitch? Um, alright. Yeah, because tank should be on field right now. Because that's the only way this can be on board. And I do remember, because... You see, uh, he he tried to take twenty four hundred life points, but I told him tank can't can't attack that turn, because like the six hundred was from uh, Fenrir attacking into Sheeran and then banishing field spell, and then twenty five from Suijin attacking directly, and then he um, he tried to take the the life points from tank, but for some reason tank isn't on field right now. I don't know what, what what's going on with um, DB, but yeah, uh, we are locked into fusion deployment, and he did D barrier us for fusion. So although we are kind of stuck with three different monsters here that don't do anything, we're not in the worst scenario because we still have potential plays next turn, like really good potential plays next turn. So it's fine. We also have Burf for recovery because we still have this Fenrir in hand. So this Fenrir special search a unicorn and then we, we'd be able to normal summon unicorn, do, do other things with it. So yeah. So we set the wind and thunder, you know, just to, you know, make them scared of it. Um, so they get more mills. Uh, they get the Sulik. They get uh, Merly. We, again, terrible mills, 
we're not milling any of our names. We're just milling like actual cards that we will want to use. Maybe, maybe not a hero lives, but we're milling cards that we'd actually just want to use. And it's just not going well in our favor. We do still have card advantage like up the ass. But like they're they're still in a situation where it's like if they play this right, they can definitely break our board down. Alright, so they make Collide of Heart, shuffle back the sewage in. They make Cross Sheep. And then they go in Kaleido Chick. And that's when I nib them. Because I didn't want them to get Kaleido Chick effect to start dumping. Because I know once they start dumping um, the Yellow Martin, Yellow Martin can add a Luna Light Spell Trap from deck to hand. Then they get to add Serenade Dance. And then they get to do more. Because they ha they also had Perfume in, in um, Engrave. So they'd be able to discard the Serenade Dance, add another card, do a lot more stuff with it. So I just like nib that right there. Special, give them the token. Uh, Kaleido Heart. So he 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 got to summon a back mill another tier limit, and then he got to make a Drago Sepalia. He crashes, and then he goes into Drago. So I start with Fenrir here, so that I can attempt to search and bait out his Drago. So for like a good two minutes, I was looking at my grave, looking at my field. I'm I'm just like fuck. Wind and Thunder does nothing. Guardian does nothing. What the hell can I actually do? And I know this token is really beefy because some of my monsters on the field was some of my monsters were on the field when this got tributed, including Tank, right? So Tank, Kaleido Heart was on field, Gamma Seal because he he tributed my Fenrir to summon Gamma Seal. So I, I just knew this token was beefy. So my entire goal was to just make Big Eye and because I was going to search, search a level seven, a unicorn, activate birth, normal summon it big eye but then i forgot birth can actually revive as well so yeah so i just summon out the second fenrir here and just fucking search anyway and then because if he would have waited until i activated my effect i it wouldn't have made a difference here but like he he, he could have saved himself potentially uh from the big eye because what the hell is another level seven monster going to do? You know, he, he definitely could have held back the struggles of Paleo because like, imagine I would have, because he didn't know that I had birth, right? So I could have went into battle phase, just swung over it. But like, I would have had to choose between this beefy ass token that has so much attack, it can kill me next turn or Drago Sepalia. And I'm definitely choosing the token, right? Because the token in, in all, you know, in all, you know, uh, essence is, is the priority here because why would I target Drago Sepalia when this token is, you know, threatening me for game? So, yeah, he definitely could have held back his Drago Sepalia negation, but I, I did still have game anyway because um, all I have to do here is make big eye and take the token. I sort of said this backwards, right? So it's because I had more life points than him. I, I can't win the funny way. I can't make Ryoku Guardian and win the funny way, but what I can do is make a big eye and, you know, uh, take the token and that's, that would be game right there. It's funny cause they were like tiger to three when, and I'm like, dude, like, you know, you could already like use tiger tiger's effect like four times in the same turn like imagine this thing was at three like holy shit that would be toxic i mean you already have triple tanky you have your perfume like you, you don't need tiger at three like come on come on but yeah uh tiger so yeah i said tiger loop is decent decent enough already i just had nib um and yeah you know from there i did win that duel so what do you guys think about tier limits um i think that especially in this game three, I was looking at his graveyard after he left the game and I was like, okay, he was playing so many things that if he milled it, it wouldn't really be good. And I think like tier limit players need to start labbing the statistics. Like now that you only have one of each name, you start, you need to start looking more at the statistics of what card should we, should we be playing that actually get us some sort of name 
engrave when we mill because although you you have like a Kelbeck and uh you know a Guido it's like you're you're siding in D barrier against gate guardian I could normal make a Baron or a Chengying so you're not really in stopping me entirely so I'm not sure what exactly his goal was with D barrier other than to hinder me for a single turn and you know siding in this D barrier you know I don't think is the best option for him because gate guardian isn't strong enough to where stopping our fusions is like the difference between like life and death you know like gate guardian fusions really just don't do that much like realistically so you don't really need to side in against us um yet you know like i don't think there's a broken gate guardian deck out there um if i didn't have nib this game i definitely would not have been able to win well you know i could have taken dragos to Paleo and just attacked directly there but still um if i didn't have nib like he would have built a really strong board against me that i would not have been able to come back from i don't think because he would have Kaleido checked there, and once he would have gone off with Kaleido check, there's so much he can do. Um, he is playing the Cyberstein, so he can. What's the play? You mill this thing with Sprind, and then you go into Cross Sheep, pointing to a fusion, and then you special summon a monster to his own of points to, and because it's pointing to a fusion, you get to bring back Stein, make Exterio. I don't think he had enough life points to do that, but like that was like a potentially a play for him, maybe early on in the game before I nibbed him. Yeah, so that was my match against Tier Elements. Uh, stay tuned, we have a few more matches to go through. I have uh, versus Sword Soul, we have Rika. You know, let me know, leave a like, a, a subscribe, you know, leave your thoughts about Gate Guardians or Tier Elements in the comments. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.